Good morning. morning. Welcome to Old Gurukun Ashton Parish Church this morning as we come to share in our time of worship and praise. Welcome to all of you here within our sanctuary and to those who are watching online as well as we do have an online audience. This is the last Sunday of Easter before next Sunday we share in the celebration of Pentecost, the seventh Sunday, therefore, of Easter. Before we gather and come before God with our intimations, let us come together and share with our welcome song, our gathering song, which is welcome everybody, it's good to see you here. We, as we are following the still the, into the restrictions, I remind you, you are not allowed to sing. However, you are okay to hum quietly. Your decibel level is entirely up to you. How, how, how badly you hum. Um, and also we can use our hands for this song as well. So it's welcome everybody. It's good to see you here. Take a moment to wave to one another and greet one another in that way. There are a few intimations, as you'll no doubt be aware. The Reverend Jonathan Fleming was inducted into Lyle Kirk on Tuesday night. So that means I am no longer having to dash to Lyle Kirk, which is good to know. Um, The... Session Clark there was very fulsome in his praise of my role as uh, interim moderator. However, he was saying that he will not miss the running commentary on Kilmarnock. (laughs) I don't know what he's talking about myself. Um... The Christian Aid collection is ongoing. There are envelopes available either door, uh, and if you want to take them away with you and bring them back either next Sunday or Pentecost, uh, no, next Sunday is Pentecost, the 23rd or the 30th, that would be absolutely fantastic. If you don't have a Christian Aid envelope but would like to give to the Christian Aid appeal, then please just leave a ma- uh, an envelope marked with Christian Aid on it at the door and it will get put into the total. Please do continue to support that if you can. Our service next Sunday will be at the usual time of 10 o'clock and obviously it will be live streamed as well. We are going to share with a Zoom communion um, on Wednesday the 26th of May at 2pm. That's Wednesday 26th. Uh, It will be via Zoom. The details are available from Jim and they can be emailed out to you, the link for it. So please do speak to Jim if you'd like to share with us at that online communion, Zoom communion on the 26th of May at 2pm. Also, today in our prayers, we remember the family of Donald Rowan, or Rowan, Donald Rowan, who, who's passed away. His funeral takes place here in Oguru Ashton on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, and then onwards to the crematorium at 11. We remember Donald and his family at this most difficult of times. As far as I'm aware, these are all the intimations. But let's go back just briefly to Christian Aid. Christian Aid um, has been an interesting one since I've been here because um, I was always used to having a Christian aid committee or being involved in a Christian aid committee in Hoyk and in Hamilton and Guruk, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have one. So the, what we do for Christian aid has been limited in that sense. But one thing that normally took place was the bridge walk with the walk across the, bridge, the Erskine Bridge, which um, Gillian McCallion organized with our Bible class for, and for a long time. Indeed, I, I can remember far back to the first bridge walk 
organized for Christian aid. Shona and I did it. When I say Shona and I did it, Shona had walked, I stood and checked everybody in and out. <laughs> We've got to do our own thing. And um, that was, it was quite an important thing. And of course, that hasn't taken place last year, hasn't taken place this year. But Gillian got together with some of our young people and actually walked the cut. Um, they did it technically in aid for Christian aid, so we're kind of doing this for them. But it wasn't the best of days, it's fair to say, that they picked. Uh, or they didn't really pick it, it picked them, I suppose. But they had a bit of a rough time. <laughs> the weather wasn't too kind. But um, as you can see, they did, they did make it. So, and it wasn't too bad to begin with. However, Jalen, I think it did get worse as you went on, didn't it? Yeah. Can I just say, I love the umbrella on the, in the head. That's a good way. Hot chocolate and tea and coffee was uh, partaken of, which was really good, particularly at the end. But I think we've got to say well done to Gillian and the Bible class and well done to all of them for doing it. So please do lend them your support by giving what you can to, to, um, to Christian Aid. I like the pink ponchos there. We should actually have old Guruk and Ashton ones made up, I think. With the joy, with the... It's obviously got worse as you went on there. So I think that's... Is that all of them? There's one more. There you go. So well done to all who took part in that and completed it. So I want to give them a wee round of applause. Well done, guys. Yeah. These are all the intimations. Um, let us come before God in our worship and in our praise. We sing together or share together in hymn 511, Your hand, O God, has guided. That's it. That's the first note. Your
Please be seated. You may or may not have heard, but there has been another change within the, restri- within the restrictions and guidelines that we're currently operating in. As of Monday, within the context of worship, worship can be led or enhanced by up to six people singing. Now, <laughs> now there are ways of doing this. Either we draw lots in the way in every Sunday, and you can decide who the six of you are going to be, or what my idea was that we would be seeking to speak to members of the choir to see if they'd be interested in um, being sharing in this, the worship uh, on a Sunday mornings uh, and helping give voice. Um, so that, because at the minute, what we are restricted to is technically one person singing or leading worship, preferably a professional singer. <laughs> You don't have that. You've just got me. Um, so that, that is one other thing that's happening. Um, there is another thing that st- struck me, particularly the last couple of Sundays. It's kind of like, um, I suspect, unintended consequences of something to happen. And that is that um, it, what is great is to see people sitting in the center of the church. See, this is what happens when you get your seats given to you and you're not told, that's my seat. So um, I hope this will continue when we do get back to normal, in verticum as normal, that um, people will still sit in the middle because it's nice being in the middle. And it's nice to, for me to see people in the middle rather than everybody sort of, I feel as though I've got problems at times. This is the Sunday that's closest to Ascension Day. Ascension, uh, Christ being taken up into heaven, the, was actually on Thursday, it's 40 days after Easter. And, and so the, the Ascension Day was Thursday. However, this is the Sunday that's closest to Ascension Day. So we're going to share within the context of Ascension without actually sharing in the Ascension Day readings. So our first reading this morning, as we turn to God, is through his word, is from the the New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 1, and reading together from verses 15 to 26. Acts, chapter 1, verses 15 to 26. And this is the direct consequences of the post-resurrection formation of the church. They're dealing... the, the, the. Disciples are dealing with the change that they're having to enact because obviously all that's happened to them and the reality of losing one of their number in Judas. So we're going to hear Acts chapter 1 verses 15 to 26 and Jim will lead us in our reading. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120 And said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Eustace, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go 
where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven apostles. Amen. The wonderful thing about Acts is it doesn't spare you the details, does it? About what happened to Judas. Everybody had heard about it, so the writer tells us. And then the process is put in place to elect a successor. I love the fact as well that as two people are put forward and then they take it to God by casting lots, which is like a bit of a form of a ballot, I suppose. So there you go, an election so early on. But the significance of this, the significance of what happens is this handing down of apostolic ministry is still relevant today because when I was ordained as a minister of Word of Sacrament, Word and Sacrament, my colleagues in ministry gathered round and laid hands on me. And at that point, the idea of apostolic succession takes place, that you're being brought into this apostolic succession even today. So it has still got relevance, a lot of relevance to what we do and how we call and share in ministry today. So let us take a moment to come before God in prayer. Let us unite our hearts as we gather together to give thanks to the risen and living God. Let us pray. Lord God, you sent your Son amongst us to live and to experience the reality of life. You sent your Son into this world that he may know the full realities of our humanity. You sent your Son to show your love, to heal the sick, to bring close to you those who you had called. You sent your Son to witness your love. You sent your Son and he died on the cross and you raised him once more, O Lord, and then raised him to your heavenly realm where he sits with you in the reality of eternal rest. We come to thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the unity of love and the reality of grace within the journey of our lives and within the work of the world that we live in. We think of the miraculous reality of the resurrection and the ascension this day, but the miracles never cease, O oh Lord. The miracles are with us every day. The miracle of our own lives, of every breath we take, the workings of our bodies, the incredible precision that goes in engineering that it represents, the beauty and wonder of creation that we see round about us. Lord, your creation is an ongoing, understand, an ongoing phenomenon. Your creation is an ongoing gift. Your love is real today as it was then. Father, as we gather together today, we come to worship you and praise you, recognizing all that you have given us in the journey of our lives, life itself, our family and friends, neighbors, colleagues, the people we meet in the street, the good times, the happy times we remember, Yes, Lord, we thank you for them all. But also we thank you for the difficult times, the painful times, because in all the experiences of life, we learn more about ourselves. We learn more about your love for us. Lord, be with us in the struggles and difficulties we face. Be with us when we're unsure and unclear of the future. As we remember the reality of the disciples after your son's crucifixion, we can understand the torment and turmoil until they saw Jesus, until they knew the reality of the miracle of resurrection. In the toil and turmoil of our lives, may we too connect with that sense of wonder and joy in the resurrected Christ, the Christ who sets us free, the Christ who is there at your right hand to intercede on our behalf. Lord God, we come before you imperfect and pure, 
We come before you with all our faults and feelings. We come to confess our sins, to recognize where we have fallen short, to recognize how we have failed you and ourselves in the things we've said and the things we've done and the things we didn't say and the things that we didn't do. And Lord, you set us free. When we confess our sin, you offer us absolution. You offer us new beginnings all through your son who died and rose again that we too might live. Father, we thank you and praise you for your spirit within us, your Holy Spirit, our constant guide and guardian. May your spirit always remind us that your love is with us all every day and that you, O Lord, love us every day. Father, hear these, our prayers. For we bring them to you in and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We bring them to you because Christ taught us to pray. We bring them together because you ask us to share in prayer. Lord, hear the prayers of your people this morning. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Our second reading is a time of prayer that Jesus shares a prayer that he shares for his disciples before the reality of the crucifixion narrative in John's gospel. So we're going to read from John chapter 17, and we need verses 6 to 19. John chapter 17, verses 6 to 19. It's a really heartfelt prayer of Jesus for his disciples, where they are going after, or what's going to happen to them after his, his crucifixion that he knows is about to happen. John chapter 17, verses 6 to 19, and again we'll be led by Jim. Jesus prays for his disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and gave them safe and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world." My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Amen. And thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word, and to his name be all the praise and the glory. We share together in hymns 245, It's a World of Sunshine. <laughs>
the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, one without end. Amen. If you, I, I don't know whether you've, I think we've sung that hymn before, but it's actually written by a minister in Lanarkshire, Ian Cunningham, who is minister in Carluke. And um, if you have ever been to Disneyland and went in the It's a Small World light ride, you would recognize the tune because it's actually a form of it. He actually asked Disney to use the real tune, the proper tune, and they said no. So he had to alter it slightly to make it different enough to be different. So that, but it is based on It's a Small World ride in Disneyland, which is quite interesting. Got nothing to do with the sermon, but it's just interesting. Ascension Day is one of the ones that we kind of not really concentrate on much, but it does happen. It happens following the reality of the narrative of Easter, Christ taken up. It's a common theme that takes place in the scriptures throughout the beginning from the Old, Old Testament onwards. Elijah is taken up. Remember, we read that not so long ago. But here is in the narrative. We could read the narrative of Jesus being taken up, but I'm not going to do that today. But the idea of Jesus ascending into heaven is very important. Indeed, it's central to one of the themes of the, one of the main creeds that we use in the church, the words of the Apostles' Creed, that creed that we recite many, many times. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. They are in the middle of the reality of the Apostles' Creed is this understanding of Christ being taken into how ascended into heaven. The Nicene Creed as well has as one of its sections, on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. So one of the main themes, the centrality of theme is this idea of Jesus ascending into heaven and sitting at the right hand of God. To be our intercessor, to be there to adjudicate to, to plead on our behalf if you have if you would like the prayer that jesus shares with the disciples is a a real prayer of of commitment it's a real prayer of concern for what he has started and what is going to continue and it, it, it taps into something that is so true in our own journey of life when you lose someone you love your life in that moment changes. It changes forever. And yet, the next day, the bills will still come in through the door. Visa will still want to get paid. So life continues, but it changes. And this is really what God is, Christ is doing in this prayer. He's recognizing that when he, following, when he is crucified that life will change for his disciples. And he's really pleading with God to make sure that God continues to bless them and be with them. He's saying to, to God that they're not of this world, but I don't want to take them out of this world. Jesus is ascended into heaven, so he's out of this physical world, this physical realm. But he's not asking God to do the same with the disciples. What he's asking them is for protection in their ongoing mission. Because Jesus is seeing and knowing and giving voice to what the reality of faith is. Faith, through him, is to be lived out in the here and now. It's to be lived out and experienced in the day-to-day -day reality of life. It is to be lived out in the world, not apart from the world. This is evidenced too in the reading we shared from Acts, where the disciples gather together. They have lost Judas, the betrayal. And of course, you've got that connection between the two readings and the understanding of what was going to happen to Judas. It's just that Acts give you, gives you a far more detailed picture of what happened to him. 
the lecture and reading for today missed that bit out. But I thought, why? Let's have a bit of blood and gore. So this image of Judas is gone, so Judas needs to be replaced. It's a bit like the reality of succession. You see it within royal families as well. We know very well that when the queen passes away, that succession will pass to Charles' her son. And so it has been this idea of things change but continue to be the same. What's the phrase, the, queen, the king is dead, long live the king? This idea of constant succession. But what is important for both readings is that there's a clear identification that the work of the church is to be ongoing and it's to be built upon the understanding of proclaiming the risen Christ and what that means for us. Another, just by the way, suddenly struck me there for a few seconds as we're reading. How weird is it that the number of the first disciples, the number of followers were told about in the narrative in Acts was 120. How weird is that? That's our new capacity. We could have fitted them all in. But there's a thought. We could have fitted them all in here. No problem, within the current restrictions. Look around you just now, where we're sitting. We could have fitted all the followers of Jesus. This book that we read, the scriptures that we share in, all the followers of Jesus, we could have fitted them in here with the current restrictions. That shows you how small the church started from. It shows you how small beginnings it grew and took legs and grew and continues to grow to this day. And it's predicated time and time again on the church being involved in the world. To me, this is fundamentally important as to what we are as a church. Because if we are only seen as a building that is open once a week, where holier-than-thou people turn up to get confirmed in their overt and obvious holiness, to go out and then show that holiness to others, not in a way of sharing, but in a way in lording it over them, then we miss the point. When we are called to be Christ in the world, it's about serving, it's about sharing, it's about making ourselves humble to meet the needs of others. It is about going to out into the community to share in the community's life. We are not separated from our normal life and community, and we should never be. Indeed, when the church does view itself as some sort of holy oasis, untouched by the horrors of the world round about us, then we lose all relevance and significance. In other words, our faith calls us to get our hands dirty in a spiritual sense by being out there for people, by sharing with people, by caring for people, by being the embodiment of love for people, by being welcoming and embracing, not just now, of course, because you're not allowed to hug till Monday. You are now allowed to hug on Monday, do you know that? Don't do it indiscriminately. Just please don't go down the town and just hug everybody. Be careful. It's still... Uh, you know, the virus is still out there. Indeed, I should point out, I'm, one, I'm working this morning under extreme difficulties. Shona got her appointment in for her second injection yesterday, last night. I got mine in for Friday coming. However, when I dropped her off to get her injection just last night, she phoned me and said, the gentleman that was doing my injection says, they've got loads left. Come on in. So, last time I got my first injection the, on the Monday, I know Tuesday happened, I just can't remember much about it. So I am heading that way rapidly as I'm speaking to you. Um, anyway, I just want you to know I'm suffering. <laughs> I'm looking for the sympathy vote here. And all you're doing is laughing. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, about being in the world. It is fundamental to us, 
or to the church that we are in the world. We are in the process just now within the Church of Scotland of rationalization. Now, I've been in the ministry now for nearly 32 years, and I would say that through the whole time of my ministry, we've been in the process of rationalization. But it makes sense. I've said to you before, if you were sitting in the Church of Scotland up today, you would not have it as it is just now. It wouldn't be like we have it. There would be one Church of Scotland in Europe. There would be one Church of Scotland in Port Glasgow. There might be more than one in Greenock, but certainly not as many as we've had. What is really strange is when you look through the Church of Scotland yearbook, there's a list of redundant churches' names, names of churches that don't exist anymore. And the number that were in Greenock is quite incredible. And what's happening, and what's going to happen this week coming through the General Assembly, as the General Assembly meets and the news filters out that we're all basically doomed, it'll be like Private Fraser from Dad's Army. We're doomed. And that's not the message that I wanted to take from whatever is reported from the General Assembly. It's a reassertion of what the church is. A re-understanding of what we are as a national parish church. And a recognition that we cannot continue to sustain what our main occupation seems to be at times, which is curator of ancient buildings. I'm not talking about curator of ancient people. I'm just talking about curator of ancient buildings. But that's what we are seem to be at times. And that's not we're here for a church. And the reason we've got all these buildings is because of the history that we've engaged in from the time of the disruption. And even before that with the various splits in the church, but certainly from the disruption onwards, where we seem to have a propensity to not get on with each other and immediately go and set up another church. I must have told you, probably told you the story before in Hoyt, one of the churches, which is now no longer there, it's now a, a petrol station. But it was the, its claim to fame as a church was the, the tallest steeple in the town of Hoyt. And why did it have the tallest steeple? Because the mill owner who endowed the building wanted to make sure his wife could see it from their house in the hill. So he made sure it was the tallest building. It lasted under 100 years. These edifices, these buildings, and this is a beautiful building that we share in, but it's just bricks and mortar. At the end of the day, what is important and what is more meaningful to me are you. You are the church, not the bricks and mortar. You are the church. You are the continuing followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. You are the ones who Christ is praying for in this prayer about protecting us in the world. To be, give us, I mean, he's talking about how he, the, the, the disciples shared the message and the world hated them. And he's asking God to protect them as they continue to share the message. And that is the same prayer for us today. That we have to have courage to stand and proclaim our faith. How often do you talk to your friends and neighbours who are not church, who are not Christian, about what you believe in? You know the old adage that you should never talk about politics, religion and football? Not necessarily in that order. In company. In case you're upset. But we're bound to talk. We should be proclaiming our faith. We should be telling people about the good news. We should be sharing what we believe in. And not being afraid to do so. That's what we are charged to do. By the living Christ. It's what we are charged to do. And empowered to do. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit that we remember coming next week in the context of Pentecost. When we forget our main missional role is to proclaim the living gospel and to be the embodiment of that gospel, when we think that we are there as some sort of holy club cut off from everyone else, then we miss the point of what the church is or should be. And then, to be honest, if we do disappear, who cares? So it is incumbent upon us 
the continued servant of the servants of the living Christ, to be that embodiment of love, to be that embodiment of care and compassion, to be that embodiment of faith, sharing what we believe in, sharing the good news. Because we know we do so by the power of the Holy Spirit. We do so knowing that we are under the protection of God. Not to say that everything in our lives will go well. I've got this, some of my f- people I know who are fairly devout, they almost have this belief that when you put your trust and faith in God, everything in your life is going to be all right. Everything will be fine. The garden will be rosy. There will be no weeds. That doesn't happen. That's not life. Life is what it is. Life has good points and bad points. Life makes us laugh and cry. Life is to be lived. Life changes constantly for us. And the different experiences of our lives and the different moments of our lives and the people who come into our lives and the people who go out from our lives. But life is still to be lived. Grab hold of it. Love it, embrace it, live every moment for the miracle that it is. Enjoy every moment of it and love every moment of it. Enjoy the moments when you're happy and laughing. Enjoy the moments when you're sad and in despair. I know Ross Finney was commenting about the fact that I seem to bring Kilmarnock into a lot of services. But I think the analogy of a football game is quite important. Because in a football game, there are moments when you're really excited. There are moments, especially when you watch Kilmarnock, when you're not so excited. There are moments when you're really elated. And then there are moments when you are really, really down. But that's life. We are not separate from life. We are called to live life to the full. And in that living life to the full, We are charged, called to share the good news. God is love. Christ died that we might live. The Holy Spirit is our helper and guide. I believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Share that message. Share what you know in your heart. And then maybe we can see the capacity of this building needing to be raised. Not just beyond the idea of two meters social distancing, but hopefully encouraging others to come and share and be part of the journey. Amen. And thanks be to God. Our hymn for Ascension Sunday is one of my favorite hymns. It is a hymn that is specifically associated with Ascension Day. Lord, the light of your your love is shining. Shine, Jesus, shine.
Please be seated. The reality of our faith, the reality of what we proclaim in the gospel and what we seek to share in the gospel is the reality of God envisaged and embodied within the reality of Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord. Christ came into this world to bring unity. Christ came into this world to show love. Christ came into this world to bring joy. But he also came to show us the way to eternal life. That is the eternal message of the living God that we share in and proclaim. Proclaim from generations. Proclaim from this pulpit. Now proclaim from the seat in front of the communion table. It is a message that in many ways has not changed over the years, over the centuries. The way it's been shared, maybe, the way it continues to be shared will change. How, which buildings we have and how many ministers there are, that will constantly change. The understanding of church may change at times, but the fundamental reality will not change. God sent Jesus Christ to bring unity to this world to show love, to bring joy, and to lead us into eternal life. That's a truth, an eternal truth, that we proclaim and seek to share with others through the reality of faith. If you think over the years, the number of people who have been in this building, the number of people who have shared in this place, done so faithfully, week by week, regular people. Think of the numbers also who maybe only come here or have been in this building and shared in a service once for a wedding or a baptism or a funeral, and yet they've still been here. And their encounter with God has been in this place. Has it changed their lives? We'll never know. But one thing we do know is the numbers and the people who have been through this building and have experienced and are shared in the reality of God's love. But then how many people have experienced God's love through the work of people within this congregation? Through the Boys Brigade, through the guides, through the young church, through the Bible class. That's being in the world. That's living faith. That is sharing the good news that Jesus came to bring unity, love, joy, and eternal life. I was thinking about this this morning because just um, a couple of days ago, or yesterday I think it was, John Lowe posted a photograph of the Guru, third Guru Boys Brigade football team from quite a few years ago. And I think, John, it's your dad who's in the photograph, isn't it? And they put it up on our Facebook page. And out of that, a lady contacted me from Blantyre, Myra, to let me know that one of her relations is also in the photograph. And the strange thing about Myra is that the first time I met her was conducting a baptism in Hill House, where on the way out the door after conducting the baptism, she said, hi, I'm Myra. I was your mum's bridesmaid. (laughs) And they hadn't seen each other for quite a few years. It's a small world. Think of the hymn we sang before the service, before the sermon. It's a small world. It's God's world. We are charged to live in this world and share in this world. And the relationships that we create and sustain, it's what it's about. Living faith, sharing faith. For God sent Jesus in this world to bring unity, to bring love, to bring joy, and to lead us into eternal life. So let us join together now in our prayers for others. We will share also in the words of the Lord's Prayer at the end. We remember the family of Donald Rowan at this time. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, Easter seems so long ago now. All the other symbols have gone. The Easter eggs are cleared from the shelves, ready for the next 
seasonal item to be brought in. The symbolism taken away from other places, but not here, not in this place, not in our lives. It seems so long since we read the narrative, read the story again, reminded ourselves of you, the living Christ, dying on the cross. It seems long ago that we greeted you, the living, the living Savior, not even death holding you. Fresh from the tomb, we remembered how you met your disciples behind locked doors, coming into their lives once more and sharing with them, peace be with you. Meeting them on the beach, peace be with you. Meeting them as a stranger on the Emmaus Road. Father, how quickly we forget the joy and the reality of your risen presence in our world because we are overtaken by the reality of the world in which we live. The day-to-day reality of life that sometimes can suck all joy from us as we deal with the issues that we face. And yet, Lord, you are there constantly in the journey of our lives. You are there when we feel that sense of desolation, isolation, forgottenness. You never forget us. You are always there for us. God, we need you so much in our woundedness. We need you to draw alongside us and those who we love to know that we're not alone. To know that we can bear out the storms of life that we face. And there is light at the other end. Father, we need you to remind us that miracles do happen and that resurrection is possible. We thank you for all who have shared our journey with us, all who have been part of our lives and we have commended to you through the journey of our lives. For we know that we are never separate from them. But that love is always real in our hearts. Father, as we gather here this morning, we are part of this, your world. An amazing world, an awesome world. And yet at times a frightening world and an unforgiving world. We look out and read and see in our newspapers and our TV screens of death and destruction in so many places. Hatred personified. People's inhumanity brought to the fore. Numbers being told of lives taken. And we despair. We despair for ourselves, for our humanity, and for this, your world. Lord, we pray for peace in all areas of conflict especially what we see just now through Palestinian and Israeli. Oh, people are quick to judge and quick to take sides. But Lord, in conflict and war, no one wins. There are only families left to mourn. More destruction and a greater sense of injustice. We pray for all areas of conflict in our world and we pray for peace. We pray that we may throughout our world not just turn away, wring our hands, but focus too on your life-giving hope or unto you and bring to you life. Focus on you, the giver of life and life beyond death. Focus on you and the reality of love shown through Jesus Christ. We pray for peace in all areas of conflict. We pray for freedom of those persecuted and borne down in their own lands. We think too of this world of COVID-19. How the world has changed so quickly. We pray that the world may come together and share. To find solutions to bring about vaccinations for all. We thank you for the skill and dedication of all who work in our NHS, but all health workers throughout the world working in such difficult circumstances. Within our own community, we thank you for all who are there to care for us in our emergency services, in our armed forces, 
and those who work in social work within our community, seeking to heal the fabric of our society, those who teach our young people to forget the mistakes of the past and to learn new ways. Father, we bring to you all within need, who are crying out in need at this time. Lord, you come into the world to love the world and to make all things new. May we see your renewing love at work and may we be the channels of that work within our own community, within our own families, within our own society, loving and serving, healing and renewing, called by you to witness to life in all its fullness. We bring before you all those who we want to remember now, Father, in your love, those who are ill either at home or in hospital, those who have lost a lover and struggle with that reality of darkness, those who have lost someone and still feel that sense of pain, days, weeks, months, years, it matters not. We bring them to you. We bring to you all who are struggling, unsure and uncertain, worried about the future, worried about what is happening to them. We bring before you our families from whom we sometimes have been separated for so long. Lord, in the silence, hear our prayers. Loving God, remind us daily of your risen power. Confront us daily with the miracle and wonder of life. Surround us with angels and those who selflessly give their lives to serve others. And whatever you call us, Lord, may we willingly serve to bring you glory, making your risen presence known in all the world, in our own community, in our own way. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for all who we remember and share. Hear our prayers for their own family at this time. Hear our prayers for our neighbors and for our friends. Hear our prayers for whoever cries out to you as we bring them to you now and as we share in the words that your son taught us to share in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, can I thank you most sincerely for coming and sharing here today. Can I remind you of Christian Aid, uh, the collect continuing collection over the next two Sundays, the 23rd and the 30th. The Zoom communion at 2 p.m. on the 26th of May. And we look forward to see, sharing with you then. As I've indicated, there have been a significant change in the regu regulations. We would be at some point soon or now probably allowed to share in tea and coffee after the service. We're not confident enough yet to do that, but we will be working towards that as soon as the restrictions continue to lift so that we can get back to what we enjoy as part of our life of this church, which is not just to meet and to praise and to, to worship, but also to share socially and to recognize and have that time together. Until that time, we continue to do what we're doing just now. Our closing hymn is from Mission Praise. Um, Mission Praise 572. Hugh and I were having a discussion about this this morning. I, th I think we've sung it before, um, because I like it, so I'm pretty sure you've sung it before, um, probably once or twice, but it's called Rejoice. If we can put up the, the, the words, thanks, to begin with. It starts with the chorus and then goes to the verse. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just to play the chorus and then the verse. Thank you.
four. I think so. It's quite an easy tune. Rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you. I have full confidence in you that you may hum it quietly to yourselves and find it a fulfilling prospect. into the world to share the good news. Go now into the world to be the living embodiment of God, that people may see Christ through you and in you. Go now with his blessing upon you. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon and dwell within your heart this day. Remain with you and be with you and all whom you love and share your journey with, now and forevermore. are marching in the light of God.
always go in peace and thank you for being you.